thank you, Peter. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the kind invitation. This is the, my first year here. Okay, let me check which uh, which one is the right one. This one and this one four pointer laser. Okay, I'm all set. Multitasking, exactly. So thank you very much for the invitation, Peter. This is my first year at the ASC Summer School, and today I'll talk with you about transcriptomics and epigenomics. Uh, I've started working on these topics only recently. I've been a, a biased researcher, as uh, we will see later in the presentation. <laughs> so I've been doing research focused on specific targets, while the, character, the main characteristics of these studies is that basically they, uh, their aim is to identify novel targets unknown targets and search, go fishing in, uh, in uh, different systems in, uh, in our body. So in this presentation, I'll try to be simple because I realize there's even from the lack of questions that not many people are familiar to this topic. So I'll try to be simple and I'll try to give you an overview. So in the first part, I will, uh, I will illustrate the promises and pitfalls of omics technologies and the role of bioinformatics. Uh, then I uh, will talk a little bit about major epigenetic mechanisms and profiling results in the heart. We will discuss a little bit about technical and experimental pitfalls of these techniques. And, and finally, I will share with you uh, some data and, and you know, some difficulties that you might encounter in case you start doing research on this, in this field in particular. We'll talk about strategies and challenges to identify new targets through combined epigenomic and transcriptomic profiling. Now, the reason why people uh, started doing this kind of research is basically a, a paradigm shift in, in biology uh, changed, meaning that people started to think of human beings of st to study the organism, not just a, a single um, um, a chain of reactions of molecules, but as a combination of different, uh, um, different specialties. And so people started to study the organism as an integrated and interacting networks of genes, transcripts, proteins, and biochemical reactions. Now keep in mind that has, just like as you did in your medical school or in your PhDs, I mean, we didn't study, of course, all of these sciences. So some of us did medicine, some of us did biology, some of us did engineering, some of us did computer sciences. Now to approach this science, you need the integration of different expertises, and you won't be able to get alone all of them, unless you're uh, like Peter, because Peter is one of the few people that have many of these expertises. So, um, the paradigm shift, the, I mean, the, the, way, the reason why we started doing this research is because basically technology has allowed us. And the Human Genome uh, Project Revolution uh, was followed by the big, uh, gigantic enthusiasm because people started to think they could really decipher the diseases and see what was going on. Actually, uh, it was very clearly mm, clear, very, very soon clear that despite this achievement, a gap exists in the understanding and advancement to meaningful translation that directly affects disease prevention and clinical care. Meaning that, of course, as we all know, uh, the genome does not explain everything, especially for cardiovascular diseases that are multifactorial and that you know, rely on many mechanisms. And as my, the previous uh, uh, excellent talker previously showed, of course, we have several layers. So we have the genome, we have the uh, transcriptome, the proteome, the metabolome, and we have the epigenome. What is the epigenome? The epigenome is something in between, we'll, we'll give some definitions, and it is something that basically connects the genome to the transcriptome. Now, to address all these different, mo different models, you need uh, technologies that are able to handle a huge amount of data, and these are omics technologies. So, so omics, usually we call omics uh, different uh, research fields, and the characteristics of the, omage, uh, the omics technologies, that they, have, they entail large or genome-wide scale. So they, have, they uh, imply that you will get and you will handle a lot of data. 
And so, indeed, one of the major promises of the omics technologies is that they, they will provide you a large amount of quantitative information, so the, what is so-called the big data. You will, uh, uh, you will uh, have the ability to access shared data sets and resources and protocols provided by a large amount of free available information. You can find mostly, you know, almost everything online. So you could access and, and, and check for your own gene, for check for your own uh, molecule and see what's there in the literature. And also it will allow, uh, omics technologies allow a holistic as opposed to a reductionistic approach as a potential to identify uh, multiple and novel tar targets, unpredictable, unpredictable targets. Now, one of the, some of the uh, pitfalls of omics technologies derive from the advantages, because of course you'll have a lot of data, they're very complex, very heterogeneous, very, you will require multidisciplinarity because you won't be able to do it on your own like you do like a Western blot on your bench in the lab. You'll have uh, problems doing data analysis, which is very complicated. And also you'll have uh, sometimes uh, problems sh um, saving, you know, um, storing the data. Because of course it's, this huge amount of data will require a lot of, um, uh, you know, instrumentation even to store it. You will require uh, data validation and also it's very expensive, even if it, it's becoming less expensive, but still. So the major challenge in this uh, field is taming complexity. How do you do this? Basically, you use some protocols of uh, artificial intelligence. And what you do is uh, basically you transform this big data into knowledge. How do you do that? You do that with the use of bioinformatics. And bioinformatics, according to Wikipedia, is an interdisciplinary field that develops methods and software tools for understanding biological data. So according, thanks to bioinformatics, you, you store, retrieve biological information, you predict function, and you finally get the data. Now, this is only a small, a selected list of websites that you can use and access to analyze your epigenomic data and tools available online. And to make a very complex story, very short and simple, as I said in the beginning, what basically uh, bioinformatics does is simplify all your data into networks uh, okay, that can be networks of transcription regulatory networks, can be metabolic networks, can be protein-protein interaction networks, or can even can be disease networks. And for example, if, if you broaden this interpretation of the, uh, of the data, you can even uh, describe uh, a disease, this is like a disease gene uh, networks in which uh, you can see each uh, ball uh, represents a disease and uh, the dimensions of the balls expresses how many genes have been um, identified correlated to that disease. So that's a way to simplify and to interpret huge amount of data. Now, a few years back, we, uh, uh, we decided to, um, to um, write a position paper, writing a position paper um, from the Working Group on Cellular Biology of the, um, uh, of the heart of the ESC, and, and I'm a member of the nucleus of this working group, and I strongly encourage you to, uh, you know, to um, subscribe and to get involved into this working group because it's very active and very, uh, you know, it has a lot of initiatives. And so we came up with this position paper trying to uh, give recommendations to dissect this novel uh, area of research. Because while the transcriptome is quite simple, even in the definition, we can say that basically that the transcriptome is the full complement of RNA molecules produced by genome, even the definition of the epigenome is not easy. So the first definition of the epigenome was, the, was given by Conrad Waddington in 1942. And what he said is that epigenome is something on top of genetics that defines differentiation. And he described this Waddington uh, epigenetic landscape, meaning that, you know, the path that this little ball could follow through the uh, landscape, uh, according to the curves, 
the, the ball would go one way or the other. And according to the path, what the ball, there is a cell, could go through differentiation, toward one cell type or another cell type. Now, m a more recent definition says that, heritable t that the epigenomic, epigenetic uh, changes are heritable changes in gene expression that occur without a change in DNA sequence. And here you see, for instance, a dog, and it, the color of his eyes are different. They have the same, the cells in his eyes have the same DNA, same DNA sequence, but the color is different. Same thing, two twins, one, one has uh, white, um, skin and the other one is black. So this is epigenetics. Now to make things even more complicated, of course we have many, many techniques to uh, identify uh, epigenetic changes and our working group recommends, of course, uh, in order to reduce variability, uh, to always use robust and streamlined methods called standard instrumentations and only where they accept protocols. But what makes really things complicated is that the epigenetic mechanisms are many, are very different. Now, uh, here represented the most well-known, but they are not the, uni the only mechanism. The most traditional method, uh, uh, epigenetic mechanisms are those involved in uh, histone modifications and DNA modifications. But there are also RNA-based mechanisms based on long non-coding and microRNAs. Now, we'll mainly talk about these two. And in addition to the histone modifications and DNA methylation, of course, these changes are induced by proteins that put the residue, so make, make the modification, uh, proteins that erase the modification, and protein that read the modification. So once you have a methylation, for instance, of an histone, there can be a protein that binds and, and then transduces a signal. Now to further complicate, the, the histone modifications not always have the same meaning. Because while uh, histone acetylation usually promotes transcription, conversely, histone methylation can have different effects according to the lysine that is methylated, to the modification, etc. How do you do this? So there are basically two different ways of addressing these changes. The first way is a, a gene targeted approach in which you consider one gene, for instance, the ATP2A2, that is known to be downregulated in heart failure and cardiac hypertrophy, and you look at different changes in the chromatin, or you look at a gene that is known to be upregulated. But according to, thanks to the omics technology, what you can do is basically integrate the analysis of, this of these modifications uh, genome-wide with the transcriptome. And so what you will have is that you will have a, a list of genes that are transcriptionally activated and uh, in a list of genes that are transcriptionally repressed and, in, and associated to each um, panel of transcription, there will be a subset of, genet of uh, epigenetic markers of transcription or epigenetic markers of um, repression. This is for chromatin uh, modifications. Now, the oldest uh, uh, epigenetic marker that has been identified is DNA methylation, considered that imprinting, for instance, is based on DNA methylation. And DNA methylation, luckily, is one univocal message, usually determines gene repression, so unlike other histone modifications. Gene met methylation is a solid message. It usually induces uh, rep gene repression. It usually is stable, even, even though this uh, assumption that uh, gene, the DNA methylation has been uh, is, uh, stable has been questioned recently. And so uh, it has been proposed in, that in addition to maintenance methylation, there, is, there can be also de novo methylation. So if you uh, uh, look at uh, gene um, methylation, DNA methylation genome-wide with using uh, omics technologies, what you will see is that basically genes that are active are less methylated, and genes that are inactive are more methylated. Where does methylation occur? It usually occurs in the promoter regions of the genes and is associated with histone modifications that are consistent with what I previously show, showed you before. Now, recently it also came uh, up that uh, DNA methylation can be converted, I mean, the, 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 the residue that is methylated on DNA can be converted to hydroxymethylcytosine. 
And so what happens is that uh, this change, this change that is the 5-hydroxymethylcytosine that has been considered uh, um, uh, an intermediate of the uh, degradation of DNA for um, only in recent years has become clear that uh, it changes uh, over the, in development and in the adult life, and not only patho pathological conditions can change the representation of this residue, of, of, of this uh, DNA modification in the, in the genome. And unlike DNA methylation, DNA hydroxymethylation mostly occurs in the intronic genes or in the gene bodies. And while it occurs in the promoter regions, it reduces transcription, but mostly as opposed to DNA methylation, it increases transcription. So it has an opposite uh, effect compared to DNA methylation. So why did I show you this? To show you the complexity of epigenetic modifications that can change, the, uh, that can change DNA, uh, that can change uh, gene expression, and to represent to you the, the, uh, the problem that not only we don't have platforms, we don't have bioinformatic tools to analyze, to, um, to study these different, uh, these is modules uh, um, contemporary. But in particular for epigenomics, we have so much information, so many different changes, that it's very difficult to know which one is more important than uh, the others. And so for this reason, it would be really necessary to get novel and simple bioinformatic methods to integrate this information, and of course, with more financing and more collaboration will be needed. Another issue that I wanted to uh, talk to you about is the, um, are, are the technical and experimental pitfalls that we experience in the lab when we compare our data with some other people's uh, data. Uh, that, that's common in research, but in this case, it, we have some technical uh, problems that undermine the possibility to compare the data, and in particular, um, the heterogeneity with, uh, within uh, biological samples, the quality of DNA, RNA, and the use of experiment animal models, for instance, the genetic background of the animal gene targeting strategies, and static versus temporal evaluations. One important issue uh, is the distinction between whole tissue and isolated cells, because Different protocols have been published to isolate cells and to do epi epigenomic studies. And so, for instance, you can use a Langendorf technique to isolate cardiomyocytes, but it has been shown also that the spatial distribution of cardiomyocytes can affect the epigenetic profile, as well as uh, some um, studies have shown that the isolation of nuclei or just the cardiomyocyte nuclei can provide differences, different epigenetic profiles compared to other uh, approaches. So uh, this is very tricky and very crucial, will be very crucial in the future to understand what's the best method and standardize it. In the uh, second part of the presentation, we wanted to ask a question, can we cure the epigenetic landscape? So we have seen there are many uh, riders, many racers, the changes in the gene uh, expression. And I actually checked on um, uh, clinical trials on uh, .gov, uh, .org a few days ago. And actually, uh, we have 222 currently registered clinical tires, cli trials on epigenetic therapies and cancer. So epigenetic therapies are already ongoing in cancer patients. And actually, there is a big literature on epigenetic therapies also in cardiac diseases. And the, most, uh, the strongest evidence for cardiac diseases is that HDAC inhibitors in many preclinical models are protective through different mechanisms. There are different inhibitors. There are different HDACs. And we recently did also a, a meta-analysis of 62 studies of new hypotheses of, uh, of these uh, cardiovascular um, studies in which deacetylase inhibitors were used. And as Peter was saying, it's surprising and amazing that most of these studies there were, and these therapies that were administered to cancer patients didn't even measure potential cardiovascular effects. So basically, we have no data regarding the cardiovascular effects of, this, of these drugs. And when they did, actually, they did register in some cases, and for some of them, uh, some important um, toxic effects. 
Same thing for DNA methylation inhibitors. The DNA methylation inhibitors used, are also used in cancer therapy, and several issues have been raised because, of course, DNA methylation inhibitors uh, uh, activate gene expression, and therefore they can activate other signaling pathways or they can derepress, for instance, antiviral pr uh, uh, programs that can be detrimental. So, in the end, is it possible to find the corner piece in this three billion pieces puzzle and find a new therapy. So the advantage of these approaches is that unlike hypothesis-driven approaches in which you select uh, a target and you validate it in, in your model system that can be in vitro or in vivo, according to this approach, you basically don't make any prior assumptions. You isolate the RNA, you isolate DNA, you test the DNA, the epigenome, and the transcriptome, and you, start, and you see what happens. So in the next few minutes, I will discuss with you some examples of how you can handle this data and what are the difficulties that you will manage. You have the feeling that you are looking for a, a needle in a haystack, and um, this study, uh, in particular, was very important for us because basically when this study was published, we were doing exactly the same thing and we had exactly the same data ongoing, so it was very frustrating and very <laughs> uh, painful to see this study published because they had exactly, uh, um, uh, they, they had you know, an experimental plan that was very similar to ours. So uh, basically in this study, um, the epigenome, the methylation DNA, and the transcriptome, and the, uh, and the whole uh, transcriptome in uh, uh, failing hearts from, fa from heart failure patients undergoing cardiac transplantation was analyzed in cardiac tissue and in blood. And so uh, the idea was to find an epigenome-wide association between, uh, epi, um, uh, between epigenetic markers and heart failure and find a new biomarker. So they performed uh, a DNA methylation study in cardiac tissue. They identified six regions that were very significantly associated with uh, uh, changes in the DNA methylation. So the first, uh, the first part of the study, they analyzed the DNA methylation. They found these changes. And then they, they, uh, they matched the changes in DNA methylation with transcriptomic changes. And they found that in 517 genes, effectively, DNA methylation was associated with gene repression. Then they looked at the blood. And surprisingly, I mean, uh, they found basically not so many circulating uh, uh, DNA, uh, um, DNA methylation markers in the blood, in particular only one that was associated with changes in uh, methylation in DNA. And when they compared um, DNA methylation results and blood methylation results, basically they only found three epigenetic loci that were significantly overlapped between heart and blood. And in, uh, uh, of course, this on all investigated levels. They were, uh, these were the um, uh, loci that were, they identified. And of course, uh, for some of them, for um, some of them, very little is known. So basically, this was the beginning of a new field of research. From our side, a few years ago, we had demonstrated that in pressure overload, cardiac hypertrophy, and heart failure, the activation of mitogen-activated uh, protein kinases in the heart could be mirrored in blood leukocytes, in peripheral blood leukocytes. So we decided at the same time to uh, analyze in uh, control patients and in heart failure patients with post-ischemic or idiopathic heart failure uh, in the myocardial samples and in peripheral blood leukocytes, the transcriptome and the DNA methylation uh, profile. We did bioinformatic analysis, and basically what we found, uh, here are the characteristics of our patients, and basically what we, they, they had, of course, idiopathic and post-ischemic, and what we found, basically, was that, of course, there were, uh, there were a lot of differences in gene expression between control and failing hearts, 
um, uh, not many uh, as expected in uh, between idiopathic and uh, between idiopathic and uh, controlled hearts. What we did basically, uh, as opposed to what the other group did, is basically analyze the um, uh, RNA changes in heart failure samples and compare them to the changes in leukocytes. So we analyzed RNAs that were different in both heart and peripheral blood leukocytes. There were not many. And to make a very short, a very long story short, we, this is the uh, DNA methylation study. We confirmed five targets. We identified basically five uh, RNA transcripts that had a similar, uh, um, uh, they, were, they were modulated in the heart and peripheral blood leukocytes. We confirmed them uh, through uh, collaboration with Duke University Human Heart Repository that provided us cardiac samples from control and heart failure patients. And among these um, uh, transcripts, the one that captured our interest was this one. First of all, because this one was the, had, was the one with highest uh, statistical significance. Uh, second, because it was increased only in ischemic heart disease, in ischemic heart failure, and was consistently increased in peripheral blood leukocytes and in the heart. Now, surprisingly, when we went to the methylome analysis, uh, none of these targets were methylated. There were no differences in methylation. And so this also explains why the other study didn't find them, because they, they did the opposite strategy. They searched for differences in uh, DNA methylation, while we searched for differences in RNA, in RNA expression. So no differences in uh, DNA methylation. And it turns out that this uh, very interesting transcript uh, belongs to a member of the uh, small nuclear RNAs. It is a non-coding RNA that is traditionally associated with nucleotide modifications in other RNA species. It basically acts as a, as a guiding pair with ribosomal RNA or other small nuclear uh, RNA and makes modifications. Um, there are other non-canonical functions, and we were lucky enough, because we were really lucky in this study, that basically this um, small non-coding, uh, this long non-coding RNA, uh, belongs to one of the orphans, uh, small nuclear RNAs. Basically, we don't have any information regarding the complementarity to a ribosomal RNA or the nuclear RNA. And if you go on Medline and search for this, you get zero results. Uh, if you search also in uh, peripheral blood leukocytes, you get zero results. And if you just search in the literature in general, you find uh, a paper on prion disease in which it shows that uh, this small nuclear <coughs> RNA is changed in the brain, is changed also in the blood, and basically responds to a, uh, sarcoplasmic <laughs> reticulous uh, stress and to oxidative stress. So maybe it might be involved in ischemic responses, cellular responses to ischemia. And also we confirmed in a mouse model of cardiac disease that this small nuclear RNA is increased both in the heart and peripheral blood nucleosides. And we are now approaching the most different part of these studies, target validation. Because, you know, for most of these studies on epigenomic uh, uh, profiling, you will have a description of the profile, but we, you don't know what the profile means. And basically, when you identify a target, uh, a long way ahead, you have a long way ahead to demonstrate that that target can actually be a drug target or uh, uh, is involved in the disease. So we did the epigenetic profile. We did uh, the expression profile. We are doing cell culture studies. And we are planning to do also in vivo model systems to, to uh, dissect the role, to determine the role of this small nuclear RNA that we identify. So if you ask me, um, are we not to ask for the omics profile yet at the bedside? Um, I'm not sure. I don't think so. But anyway, I'll say that I'm biased by informatic analysis of full epigenomic and transcriptomic profiling of cardiomyocytes can lead to identification of novel molecular targets that, however, identification and validation of the most clinically re relevant epigenetic marks will be needed to implement target identification. 
it also remains unclear whether epigenetic markers are driving factors of disease or onset of progression or are merely indicators of, G of transcription deregulation. And also, it is possible, uh, the possible effect of environmental factors such as comorbidities, drugs, and risk factors should be determined. And finally, although we know that circulating biomarkers are attractive candidates to improve precision medicine, of course, studies in circulating cells should be always interpreted cautiously and possible mirroring mechanisms should be always investigated. I have to thank uh, people in the lab, especially Roberta and Nicola that are here. And I have to thank our collaborators in the Monaldi Hospital that provided the first samples, human samples, and, and then the uh, Duke University Human Heart Repository that provided us the confirmation samples, and then the uh, members of the Epigen flagship project in Naples that supported us with bioinformatics and, uh, and other studies. And thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much. Then uh, questions from the audience, especially those who are familiar with any of the uh, omics approach. Thank you. I'm not familiar with the omics approach, but <laughs> there for this question. Um, so we always say it's unbiased, and I was wondering, um, is there a chance that it is not so unbiased? Because, uh, of course, we have our databases we use to, uh, to map the results, which are maybe not unbiased. And also, if you see a list of, of, of targets or anything, uh, you might focus on the ones that you already know and not on the ones you don't know. Do you know what I mean? So it's a, yes. My question is going echoing this one. So, uh, nice, very nice talk. Uh, it's the same question. So we have big data, really big data, and you, you nicely showed how we put them in uh, computers. And then we get out with uh, some simplification. So here the keyword is simplification. So then we are somehow uh, impairing our holistic approach and we are, we are becoming reductionists. So do you, s do you envisage any way to, to overcome this uh, limitation which is intrinsic to humankind, right? Actually, I don't think it's a limitation. I mean, the way to simpl simplification is necessary to analyze the data. The, way, the reason why I showed you the, uh, our results on the small nuclear RNA is because that was total and a total, uh, a complete example of unbiased research. We had no idea why that came up. So you, you put, uh, now, what, what is tricky is the bioinformatic analysis, especially because you don't do it. You will need collaborations. You will need a biostatistician. A and so you will give the queries, and, you, and he will give you the data, and you will analyze with him the data. But of course, I think that's the only way to get an unbiased approach. Now, from now on, it won't be unbiased anymore. Because, of course, now we are silencing this RNA. Now we are, we are starting to think about uh, genetic modified animal models. We are trying to modulate these levels in vitro and in vivo. From now on, it won't be unbiased anymore, of course. There are some questions afterwards. Uh, OK, we, I have also comments. Please. Great talk. Um, I, uh, you just said that uh, uh, we should need a statistician to um, help us in analysis, but uh, um, this is not possible. This is not always possible. Um, for example, in my institute, I, I don't have a statistician, so I have to interpret for myself my data. Uh, um, and it's really hard, and uh, the actual question is, uh, do you have uh, uh, an advice on yes, online okay, so courses or something? Yes, so this is a crucial issue. We were stuck for a year because our bioinformatic got married. She <laughs> went to Malta. Oh, yes. <laughs> and we lost her. And, and you know, I, I would strongly recommend that if you want to search for a job that will give you money, do bioinformatics. This is my strongest recommendation. There are few. It's not like doing ANOVA. 
yes. you won't be able to handle it. Yes. You know, you need a, a special expertise and, and uh, qualification. So it's not something that you can make in your own lab handy. You know, so you'll need people that do this and this is a crucial issue. In fact, one of the issues that, for instance, I'm raising in my university, I don't know in yours, but in my university, we don't have one exam on bioinformatics. Not one. And we, have, we have a medical school. We don't have one exam. We have statistics, but we don't have bioinformatics. And in many PhD programs, this is not even uh, mentioned. But now, you know, this will be the future. It will be very important to be able to handle this amount of data. And this is not something that you can do in a week or you go to SPSS and, and you learn. It's not like even not doing like meta-analysis. It's not like you, you have a course and you learn how to do it. it. It's totally different. So it's something very complex. And, you need, and, and that's a big issue because there are few that have this expertise, few people. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, in fact, the, the cell lineage tracking method um, to determine the origin of, of cell, uh, for example, in Prague, concerning trans differentiation of vascular smooth muscle cell to macrophage, is based on uh, methylation and acetylation changes. So this is a useful method to determine the origin of cell. Absolutely, and not only. I mean, now we can do transcriptomic analysis and epigenomic analysis on single cells. So now the technology is so powerful that you can do this on a single cell resolution. Uh, the problem is that when you compare data, at, uh, even plating a cell in culture for two days cha can change, not methylation that is very stable, but the uh, chromatin profile can change. So that will make uh, comparisons very difficult very difficult. C can I ask a similar question out of complete ignorance? You generate huge amounts of data and look at differences based on the samples of a few cells, a few patients, a few comparators. How robust is that? And how often do you have to repeat it to see if the conclusions you draw from these small sample numbers with huge data are real? Yes, so, so that's, that's a very important issue. In fact, most of these data can be replicated in different uh, cohorts of patients. So for instance, what we did, uh, I haven't shown much of this uh, paper because of, I, I have a, a feeling, a bad feeling about this paper. I, I, want to be, I want it to be published and then I'll show it. Uh, so uh, so the, the, the thing is that basically you start we started with patients in Naples that were undergoing cardiac transplantations. We had a small cohort. We found our uh, transcripts and we confirmed them in another cohort at Duke, from Duke samples. They, had, they have a repository of hearts. They have many hearts that are available. Of course, it took us like six months to get the permission from our ethics committee and their, ethic, and their ethics committee to get the samples, but finally, we made it. And so you have to confirm, of course, what you're saying is correct, uh, absolutely correct. You have to confirm what you find in your population in other populations and if available in other data sets. So that's the advantage. And then you have to validate back in vitro and in vivo in clinically relevant models to demonstrate that what you have found is meaningful. Uh. I just want to join the discussion about bioinformaticians. So I agree that it's absolutely important that we have people who can handle large data. But having worked with many bioinformaticians, I often find that for them any protein RNA is just the a same. irrelevant <laughs> kind of right number or abbreviation. If I ask them what type of protein it is, they don't even know. So it's just that I think there is this interface where you on one hand have people who handle large data and on the other hand you have the biologist who knows what actually the function of the protein is. And I often find that the synergy between them, this is where you make the novel discovery. I've never had the case that I could just give a data set to a bioinformatician, press a button and get yeah, an answer. No, of back. Course. Um, and the other question was about your RNA profiling in tissues, right? In the heart, we know that most nuclei are not coming from the heart. Yeah. So from the cardiomyocytes. So to what extent are we actually just profiling 
you know, the, the non-cardiomyocytes in the tissue. Because, you know, if you do proteomics, we know the majority of proteins comes from the cardiomyocyte. Yes. But if you do RNA or DNA, actually most of your RNA DNA comes from the non-myocyte. Yes, you're totally right. But unfortunately, working on uh, DNA or human DNA on human cardiac samples is very complicated. And especially in Naples, the hospital that was nearby, they gave us the samples. They were so small. We tried to isolate cardiomyocytes. We were not able to make it. So after many uh, trials, we decided to do the tissue lysis and uh, because it was impossible. I mean, our hands, given the very, very small amount of tissue that you could get, it was impossible to do uh, isolation of uh, uh, cardiomyocytes. So, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, I have some comments on the questions on the biased thing that uh, we, it's, of course, there's no definition, but we mean unbiased uh, workflow when you measure everything, what you can. And uh, basically transcriptomics uh, has the technology to measure all known uh, transcripts, for example, or genomics to measure all known genes. Uh, in transcriptomics, coding or non-coding in proteomics, for example, uh, you have to select because, as Manuel said, uh, you could either measure the high abundance or me medium or low abundance proteins. This is a kind of a bias, but if we a little bit think it further, uh, afterwards we have the unbiased measurement. We need a, need a bioinformatician or, or a mathematician or whatever, and but there uh, they need to have some of uh, a hypothesis. So basically the bias goes to the bioinformatics now. And uh, I totally agree that with the bioinformatician we cannot do anything, so it's better to have a, a someone who do also me uh, medical science and uh, informatics. So this is, really, it took us two years to find someone to do this, so. So do this. Yeah. You'll do this. Rich. So you can you can do you can <laughs> learn you can learn coding. Uh, there are courses you can do it. So yeah, talk to my cash there. Yeah, he's uh, in in this business, uh, farm D and uh, uh, learning coding. So okay, thank you very much. If no more questions, thank you.